and even somewhat rare in the national lab system. We tend to have national labs that specialize in basic energy science, basic science, and others perhaps that are a little more applied. Sandia certainly is viewed as a bit more applied, and I, I sit in the area of Sandia that it crosses the spectrum, but you know that's why what attracts me to the national labs and Sandia. Yeah, I will say that Sandy is known specifically for being a really engineering oriented lab. And so I think we tend to attract more of the engineer types, but still there's plenty of room for people like me who want to do both. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back to the It's a Material World podcast. I'm your host, Puneeth. I have David, my co-host, alongside me. How's it going, David? It's good. It's good. Yeah. Just getting back into the groove of things on uh, college campus for the last time. Uh, so oh, that's yeah. very nice. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it's kind of getting crazy over here. Um, there's a lot of uh, companies visiting and we're ramping up to our career fair season. So everyone's kind of uh, nervous around here. Uh, but it kind of leads us into our uh, podcast episode today, which is with Sandia National Laboratory. Uh, we talk a lot about the research that goes on there, what positions are open, and it is potentially somewhere that you should look for because they do a lot of college recruiting. So I know for Georgia Tech, there will actually be a booth here. So uh, a very interesting and insightful because our guest is a very, very knowledgeable person, especially in material science. So what is your favorite part about the episode? Yeah, our, our guest is Dr. Brad Boyce, who's like distinguished staff um, at Sandia, and he's also the vice president of TMS. Um, so he's super involved in the material science community. Um, I just thought it was super cool. Like he went into interpenetrating lattices, right? Um, very early on in the episode. And it was like a material that we've never seen before. Like he invented, he and his group invented this new material that's like six times tougher than if you uh, just looked at those individual lattices themselves. So um, this might be one of those episodes where if you want that visual component, um, he really, you know, he 3D printed this, this part. Um, so that's where you can check out our podcast on YouTube to get that visual aspect of it. So just a general recommendation there. What was your favorite part? Yeah, no, it was just uh, amazing to see his perspective because uh, he talks about the fundamental research and its effect on the greater uh, application. And so at heart, he's very fundamental. And so talking about his discoveries uh, and the process of finding out something completely new that's contrary to everything that we know so far and convincing yourself and then others that this is an actual discovery was a fascinating journey that he took us on. And then also all these applications that he has had a direct hand with. Uh, some are like the uh, interconnecting lattices. Uh, he talks about some machine learning that he's doing. Uh, there's a range of applications that he himself has worked on. And it's just great to see that he would get an application and then from the application, he would get to ask why. And that led to a lot of research that he's done, which I think is not available in industry. And it kind of highlights the differences between uh, what you could expect in industry versus what you could expect in national laboratories, which we also touch on. For sure. For sure. So yeah, it's a great episode. Um, if you like it, please leave us a rating and review on Spotify or Apple. It would really mean the world to us. Um, so yeah, without further ado, let's get into the episode. Our sponsor today is Johnson Mathy. Are you a material scientist or engineer who wants to be part of the drive for a world that is healthy and cleaner, both for today and for future generations? By understanding the relationship between a material structure and its physical properties and chemical behavior, material scientists and engineers at Johnson Mathy develop sustainable technologies that are catalyzing the zero transition in transport, chemicals, and energy. They design porous materials for catalyst supports for emission control systems that remove harmful emissions produced by diesel and gasoline engines. They innovate new compositions for catalysts at the heart of the hydrogen fuel cells in trucks and buses. And they also develop new corrosive-resistant reactors for processes that enable the production of sustainable chemicals and fuels. To find out more, visit Matthew.com. That's M-A-T-T-H-E-Y.com. Johnson Matthew, inspiring science, enhancing life. Hey, everyone. So for today's episode, we're very excited to welcome Dr. Brad Boyce. 
distinguished member of the technical staff at Sandia National Laboratories. Brad is also the vice president of the Minerals, Metals, and Materials Society, or TMS. Um, and since earning his PhD in material science and engineering from the University of California, Berkeley, Brad has over 20 years of R&D experience, which includes almost 200 publications and over 7,000 citations. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Brad. Thanks. It's great to be with you. Awesome. So yeah, uh, we'd love to talk to you about Sandia today and to get us started. I think that when I think about governmental research, it's hard to imagine the scale of it. So could you start by talking about the size of Sandia and the breadth of projects that are undergone there? Yeah, Sandia is a huge place. We have uh, over 14,000 employees, I think. And we do over $4 billion of research every year. So uh, there's a lot of things that we cover. I think uh, Sandia describes itself as a multi-mission laboratory. We do a lot of different things. I think the general umbrella, as I think I heard it once, was uh, supporting, uh, enabling technologies for uh, global peace. And I sort of like that. That was the sort of one that rang, rang with me. But so that's everything from, uh, you know, our core historical mission, which was supporting the safety and security of the nation's nuclear weapons stockpile to uh, renewable energy resource, energy security, to uh, defense related technologies as well. And so there's a really wide gamut. I mean, even within the energy domain, there is a lot of sub research in, you know, every form of renewable energy you've heard, uh, nuclear reactors, uh, wind turbines, photovoltaics, uh, emerging technologies. So uh, those are all the applied spaces. And then underneath that, the area where I'm at at Sandia is really the foundational science branch of Sandia. Uh, and that's another motto that stuck with me over the years about Sandia is uh, they use the motto of science-based engineering, the idea that we're not just ordinary engineers, we're engineers deeply founded in a scientific foundation. And I sit here at the scientific foundation of what we call Division 1000 uh, within Sandia. And so you talk about all these applications and they're very common in industry. And so I know that I'm curious when I was going through school, uh, what do you think the main difference is between the research that is done at like a national lab versus a industry that go after like solar cells or the same type of application? I've heard people say that we do the research that industry can't do or shouldn't do. <laughs> so the shouldn't do perhaps is related to stuff that has to be treated in a special way. You don't want profit margin uh, shading certain types of research, uh, but then also can't do, again, speaks a bit more to the fact that we have a really deep scientific foundation in the way that we approach our applications. And, and sometimes industry can't afford to have that long reaching deep investment in um, the foundational research that underlies their engineering. So one interesting component of our field is this combination of material science and engineering, right? We don't see that mechanical engineering, chemical engineering. So I wanna really dive into your projects and how you, you mentioned this concept of science-based engineering. So uh, you mentioned in kind of a previous call that we had privately um, that your, you and your group invented a, a new meta material involving interpenetrating lattices, um, yeah. which is very, very interesting. So can you elaborate on its uh, unique properties and what that process is like of inventing a new material? Sure. Let me start with what is a lattice in the first place, because uh, it might not be familiar. I mean, uh, <laughs> actually, the, the term probably stems from uh, technology that was developed 30 years ago in engineering we call honeycomb. We make aluminum honeycomb in aerospace. It's part of the way that we can make our aerospace structures stiff, but yet light. And it, it really is that aluminum honeycomb is a lot like a bee's honeycomb. It's like, like this open structure of walls that separate empty space. And that architecture of material is not only useful for bees, it turns out to be very stiff per unit mass or very strong per unit mass. It's good as a crush energy absorber, it's also good as a, you know, a stiff structure. Uh, that's evolved, especially uh, over the past several years with 3D printing or additive manufacturing becoming more common. We can manufacture much more complex structures beyond just a honeycomb. The traditional honeycomb was fabricated by a process that involves stamping sheets of aluminum into 
half hexagons and it was a sort of a straightforward process. Now we can make sort of any architecture we want. So now we, this is an example of a lattice. Can you see that in the, is that focusing up in the camera? Yeah, can you also talk through it for our audio listeners right. too? So this is just a bunch of empty space with struts connected at nodes. So it's a, it's a combination of air and material. And the material is a bunch of struts connected at nodes, much like the trusses of a bridge. So if you've seen the underside of a bridge and you see that truss-like structure, in fact, some people call these truss materials or architected materials because it looks a little bit like inspired by architecture. So you brought up the interpenetrating lattice. So that was, we, we got into the metamaterial, what we call metamaterials. We use a lot of different names for the same thing. Metamaterials, <laughs> lattices, truss materials, architected materials. The Germans now like a new term that I like to programmable materials because you can program the material to have whatever properties you want based on the shapes that you architect. Okay. Normally in material science, we process the microstructure to affect its properties. But here we can design the shape of the, what we call the topology, the shape of the material to control its properties. And that's a new way of looking at material science for me. But when I was starting to look at what had already been done, they were connecting struts at nodes like the example I showed you there. And what we realized was an interpenetrating lattice could be two lattices woven through each other. And again, for those that can see the video, I'm showing you that there. These are two in quasi-independent lattices that are not necessarily touching each other, but they're woven completely through one another. And this was just sort of a, an invention we had, you know, through a, a bunch of brainstorming sessions, we, we kind of were asking, how could we control energy dissipation or energy management in a way that ordinary lattices haven't yet tapped into? And so an ordinary lattice or, you know, again, think of the, the trusses underneath a bridge. They transmit energy in this for a bridge, it's mechanical energy through the trusses, through the struts, the steel structure, the steel girders. But my inner penetrating lattice not only transmits the energy through the lattice, but across lattices from one lattice to the other. And therefore the energy has to jump a gap. And anytime energy has to jump a gap, you can regulate that energy transfer through the gap configuration. And so this is a, not only just a new shape that people had never done before, to my knowledge, it's a new way of thinking of engineering lattices to control energy transfer. And so we had another guest on who talked about metamaterials that you're talking about, but they're talking about like the nano to micron range. And now you're talking about these more wide scale engineering applications. Um, when you talk about the size scale, do you start differentiate between these different applications with the terminology? Or uh, at what point does the size start to determine some of these values that you try to control, like the strength between the two lattices, et cetera? Well, you ask a great question. Certainly, as you shrink these lattices down into the nano to micro regime, their properties can become different. And that's because the materials themselves become constrained by their volume and you're scaling the system down. And eventually scaling laws are not, you know, eventually scaling laws saturate out. Uh, they, you know, you essentially in the limit of a single atom, it's going to have a different property than a collection of atoms than a microstructure. And so you, so you break down these scaling laws that, so there's really, as you scale these down into the nano and micro regime, there's new physics that become dominant. And those can be particularly useful in the design of lattices. But even at the macro scale, in the examples that I showed you here, there are already interesting metamaterials for us to use, even with kind of macro scale homogeneous properties. So I'm just wondering, what is that like? What could this unlock in terms of applications in the future? You know, if we um, really get the processing right and, and, and things of that nature. Yeah. So the interpenetrating lattice, there's kind of like we're, we're just starting to tap into all the potential useful applications for these. But I'll give you a couple examples. Um, when you make these two lattices quasi-independent, you could think of this as the cathode and anode of a battery. Now the cathode and anode are structurally robust. So now you can have a structural battery. That's one example of an application. 
Uh, you know, we're really interested. My background is in mechanics and materials. You talked about the intersection of domains, you know, material science with other application domains. And my focus has always been in the intersection between material science and mechanical engineering. And in that domain, I'm thinking about the use of these types of structures as stress sensors. So when you press, when you apply stress to one color and not the other, it presses in the, the two sublattices press together. And when the two sublattices press together, they can transmit energy across that interface. And so their energy transmission or the resistance to energy transmission changes with stress. What that means practically is electrical resistivity of these structures are stress dependent. Most materials have a weak dependency between stress and resistivity. This material has a profound change in its resistivity as a function of stress. In fact, we compared it to ordinary strain gauges, the, the commercial standard for this sort, of, this sort of sensor. And this is about six orders of magnitude more sensitive to stress than a strain gauge. I know you mentioned before that it was like this interpenetrating lattice could be like up to six times tougher than like the individual lattices themselves. Is that that six times related to this uh, six orders of magnitude in sensitivity or are they completely separate? Uh, coincidence that the number six is both. Okay. <laughs> uh, but yes, you brought up another application. Actually, at the core of what I study is fracture of materials. And so we just got a paper accepted in the journal Matter. It will be available soon on the fracture toughness of these interpenetrating lattices. And there we show, depending on the shape, the topology that you choose, we've already demonstrated up to a six times factor of toughening. We've toughened the material six times tougher than the individual constituent lattice by itself at equivalent density. You have to keep density constant here because density is a big knob in these. Um, and so uh, you have to compare them at equivalent density as we did. But actually what was even more shocking to me was that some of these interpenetrating lattices were tougher than a solid block of the base material. So this open structure with a bunch of air in it is actually tougher than a fully dense block of the exact same material. And normally, normally uh, there's this uh, scaling law that just basically says toughness should drop precipitously with density. So as you add more and more air to a structure, the general scaling is that you should lose your toughness immensely. But here we're adding the air in a material in a shape that allows it to not only hold its toughness, it actually becomes tougher. And that like, that's so cool to me. Yeah, that's awesome. So when you talk about, basically you're making materials more efficient by allowing more air. And so now maybe a different question is a lot of times now we're thinking about how to almost make alloys. So now you can start to mix like up four, six, eight elements at a time. And so when you are doing your research, what is the motivation or the priority between materials exploration and structure lattice uh, exploration? And how does that kind of make the path for you to go further in this domain? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm traditionally trained as a metallurgist. And most of my research has been in traditional process structure property for metals. And I've worked a bit in uh, ceramics and polymers and even biomaterials. So chemical modification of alloys for creating the microstructure that we want to control properties is actually where a lot of my research lies. In my metamaterial research, I'm focusing largely on the topology because that to me is a new knob that I haven't had a chance to play with yet. So I'm really particularly interested in that research about how we optimize shapes. And you know, I know what underlies that, which is how do we print the actual constituent materials and what's the microstructure of the constituent materials and how does that also control the properties of these metamaterials as well? So in my past year of you know working in the industry, I've learned that especially in this new product development stage, um, we're incorporating like the process development teams and the manufacturing teams very early on in the process. And I'm just wondering, uh, is, is it similar at a national lab or like when we're, when we're very early on in, in the R&D, like, like you are um, with this interpenetrating lattice, I can see maybe some 
a lot of challenges with processing that, um, especially at a high scale. So I'm just wondering, what, what does that look like? What are the processing challenges there? Well, actually, first, I want to give a bit of a disclaimer. Actually, it turns out in 3D printing, these are quite easy to print. Many different 3D printers that can print any shape can print these quite easily, partly because they're sort of self-supporting. The lattice is naturally a self-supporting structure. So you don't have these free structures standing in space, these free features standing in space. These are like, actually it turns out to be, they're quite easy to print. In fact, we've printed them on four different types of commercially available 3D printers. Here's another example where we printed it in stainless steel. Now I can't uh -huh. color the stainless steel two different colors, but so you have to take my word that there's actually two quasi independent interpenetrating lattices <laughs> stainless steel parts. So, I mean, actually, it turns out that these are quite manufacturable. But I mean, I guess I'm answering the opposite of the question, which is <laughs> how do you uh, make sure that you work with manufacturing engineers and so forth early on in the development? I mean, usually I'm on the other side of that equation. I'm the material scientist who's brought in sometimes too late in the game when, when the manufacturing has gone awry. And so uh, San Diego does have a pretty healthy culture around, you know, all the stakeholders being involved from the early stages of design. But of course, you know, it's often the design engineers, the mechanical engineers that start the ball rolling. And, and as material scientists, it's our job to partner up with them as early as we can and help them understand what the material ramifications are of their uh, designs. So I'd like to transition now to um, another kind of fundamental concept um, that that you your group focuses on, which is like nanocrystalline metals. Um, and so uh, one thing that isn't really discussed in in class is that fatigue kind of drives grain growth, right? Um, and so with uh, nanocrystalline materials, it doesn't necessarily fail by an ordinary mechanism. So I was just wondering if you can kind of talk about this new phenomenon that uh, you and your group have discovered recently in um, the, the, the process in, in more detail. Well, you just mixed two terms that I think most people have never heard of in the same sentence, or perhaps even in the same class. Because if you read textbooks on grain growth or microstructural evolution, uh, I don't think many of those textbooks, if any, contain the word fatigue. And then if you read textbooks on the mechanical properties of materials, like in the fatigue behavior of materials in particular, the sections on fatigue generally won't mention the term grain growth. But what we've discovered are these nanocrystal metals actually marry the two subjects. So let me first explain what is a nanocrystal metal. So almost all of the metals that we use today vast majority of them are polycrystalline, which means they're arranged with a set of grains. These are crystals that are joined together in a seam, uh, at a seam that we call a grain boundary. And these grain boundaries are invisible to the human eye typically because they're microscopic, but that means that they're at the scale of a few micrometers. These individual grains are typically in the, in the metals that we use in our everyday life, measured in the micrometer to millimeter range. Well, over the last several decades, researchers have become interested in how we shrink those grains down into what we call the nanocrystalline regime, where the grains are a thousand times smaller, uh, one you know, on the order of tens of nanometers instead of tens of micrometers. And when you do that, as you shrink the size of the individual grains down, the density of those grain boundaries, those seams between the grains, there's more and more grain boundary content. And those grain boundaries can block the ordinary uh, mechanisms for material deformation and failure. So now into fatigue. The ordinary mechanism that metals fatigue by involves the crystals deforming by plasticity or slip. So the crystals, the atoms in the crystals slide past one another in a process that we call slip. And that ends up creating extrusions and intrusions that create notch-like stress concentrations and lead to the crack formation. The problem with nanocrystal metals, the grains are so small that they constrain that process of slip. The grain boundaries can't hold, or the grain boundaries prevent the uh, um, process of the formation of these extrusions and intrusions, at least so we thought. But what we found as we, continue to study the fatigue behavior of various nanocrystal metals over a period of 
about a decade, was that these nanocrystal metals didn't undergo the traditional form of slip or plasticity, but their grain boundaries moved under fatigue loading. And again, this like just blew my mind because the, the two courses were separate to me. The two ideas were separate to me, but uh, fatigue induced grain coursing. And it turns out we can induce grain coarsening or grain growth in these metals actually by not just fatigue, even when you indent or tensely deform some of these nanocrystal metals, their grain boundaries move during the deformation. And that there are actually several different mechanisms by which that can occur. It's just a completely new concept. But now we're starting to learn how to control the grain growth and prevent fatigue failure that way. And so when you make a discovery such as this, is it ever hard to convince people who had previously thought one way or the other? Or what does the explanation and like the getting the word out there look like for you as a scientist? Well, you know, I think first hard part is convincing yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I spent years not telling people what I thought because I didn't believe it myself. I, I needed to confirm in a number of different ways this crazy thought on fatigue-induced grain growth because it was so different from what I had learned. And I thought for sure I had done something wrong in the lab or, you know, so I, I luckily convinced people at least that there was an interesting question. And uh, through funding to explore this research, we were able to slice through this problem in a number of different ways. And then with each new slice, I got more confident and I also got a little bit more outspoken. And I'd show up at conferences and I'd talk about my ideas a little bit more freely. I'd also write papers and put this concept together as I pieced together the, the individual pieces of evidence to show that this actually really is a phenomenon that occurs. And, you know, it's still ongoing. We still don't really fully understand the fundamental mechanisms, or at least what I now believe to be a competition of mechanisms that can contribute to this phenomenon. And so maybe going back to the more technical side, if you can control this deformation, and so it doesn't um, deform in this unique pattern of the grain growth, what benefits mechanically are you like projecting to get um, from this new type of material microstructure? Yeah. So uh, again, you, you got me excited because it can point to a recent paper. We just published a paper in Acta Materialia this year uh, where we added a solute element. So this is a, you start with a pure metal. In this case, we started with platinum, which has some scientific value to it. It actually turns out to be technologically relevant because we use metals like platinum for electrical contacts as well. So they're actually uh, widely used. But we, to this pure platinum, we trickled in a little bit of gold. If, as long as you got platinum, you might as well add another expensive <laughs> element. There's actually a really strong thermodynamic and kinetic arguments for why we added specifically gold to platinum, but I won't get into those here. Uh, the gold was chosen because it does a special trick. It, it segregates to the grain boundaries and it stabilizes those grain boundaries by lowering their energetic cost to the system. So the grain boundaries become more happy in the system by the addition of gold. And in doing that, not only did we stabilize the grain boundaries, it turns out we made the material more resistant to fatigue. Because as I already explained, the fatigue process involves grain growth, and now we're sort of mitigating the grain growth, thereby increasing the fatigue. And what we showed in active materialia, one measure of the fatigue resistance improved by 75% just by trickling in a little bit of gold. Wow. And for engineers to be able to improve the fatigue resistance of an alloy or a metal by 75% with one simple trick is pretty profound. I'm very excited about that. Interesting. I guess I'm just curious. I know you said you didn't we didn't have to go into it, but what, what is it about like the gold itself or the platinum that kind of allows it to maybe stabilize? Well, you know, that's unfair because you told me that the audience, could, <laughs> general audience, including undergrads, have got to get into things like heat of segregation and uh, you know, enthalpies of mixing and things like that. <laughs> you know, let's just say thermodynamics does play a role in terms of the gold wanting to sit at the grain boundary and in terms of the, the gold lowering the, the energetic cost of the grain boundary. Okay. 
yeah, that, that's good enough, but okay, that's awesome. Um, and then taking it back to just like, how did this uh, question or this topic even like um, come to your table as something that you really wanted to dive into? I know you mentioned it kind of as like a, like a just fundamental principles, like a think tank, right? And so I'm just wondering like, uh, is that different from the, like the research that you've been doing in the past? Like how, does, how did this come to the table? Oh, you know, you ask a great question there. It turns out that there was a, originally an applied question that I was looking into uh, in, in concert with a mechanical design engineer. He was designing a new type of sensor with uh, a microfabricated technology, microfabrication technology. So uh, back in the day, we were using some microfabrication to make metals and, and to pattern them in a way that would allow it to be a sensor. And he came to me and he said, well, this sensor, you know, it's going to move back and forth a lot. And, and we're making these metals in a new way through electroplating. So, uh, you know, I just want, he said, Brad, could you please confirm that the fatigue response of this newly formed metal will be okay? You know, it'll, it'll be safe in my engineering design. And that really was the kickstart of the whole thing. I, I uh, was using uh, electroplating to microfabricate these metallic fatigue samples, the miniature, really even microscopic fatigue samples for him to answer his fundamental question, are they going to be okay in fatigue? And it turns out because they were being deposited as nanocrystals, they already had a pretty good resistance to fatigue because they, they didn't undergo the traditional slip process. And again, that, that took me a little while to convince myself because they were actually impressive. And I was able to quickly answer his question and say, hey, these are really good in fatigue. And, but it led me to this deeper question about why they're so good and what we can do to control them. And so I think that is a big difference between industry and academia or uh, more governmental research is because if that happened in industry, I feel like we're like, okay, cool. Let's just keep on going. That's, that's great. We'll keep that in the back pocket. So when you do this, uh, I, I guess more fundamentally, why do you think, or sorry, why do you think it's valuable to keep on pushing these questions? And then wh what in the governmental research allows you to push these questions while not feeling confined by these applications that you were originally supposed to be working on? Right. Yeah, you, you remind me of another little story, and I'll do this without revealing names or institutions. But a, uh, another engineer came up to me around the time that I was having this dis original discovery of the, the great fatigue resistance of these metals uh, from a Fortune 500 company, I won't name them. And he said, you know, we've been making a product and uh, we've been making it out of these same types of metals. And that product is lasting way longer than we thought it would. They said, you know, we're selling tons of this product and we don't understand why it's lasting so long. They said, actually, we thought our original design wouldn't be uh, marketable because we thought it would fail, but we were just trying to like kind of get our legs underneath us. And they're like, but it never fails. And we got like, you know, a lot of these fielded, like I'll just say millions and millions of these parts fielded. And um, they, they really just, you know, the, again, to your point, they, they were glad to make a profit off of it. They were curious, but they didn't have the time or money to ask the question why. So I'm glad that places like Sandia can ask the question why, because then once we understand the fundamentals, we can extend it to other applications. Uh, and maybe even uh, our fundamental understanding will help advance the basics of the way that the way we tailor materials in the future. Uh, so now the last part of your question is, you know, how do we, I think, fund this sort of research? And, and this is where I comes back to what I said earlier about Sandia being a multi-mission laboratory. On one end of the spectrum, we have engineers designing various uh, global security related products. And on the other end of my domain, where people are doing more fundamental research, and here I get uh, funding from places like uh, the DOE Office of Basic Energy Science, provides great funding for answering these fundamental mechanistic questions about why materials do what they do. And so I've heard just on the internet, uh, there is some flack for government research facilities like NASA for all the money they create, or all the money they suck in and technically don't output anything to society. But really, when I look at it, I see the value of answering the question, why? So if someone was to ask you why 
funding like billions of dollars. Uh, you said like four billion dollars worth of research comes out of Sandia. Why is that important, even if it's not coming to like a profit for the United States? Quote yeah. unquote. One way that I look at this is through the perspective of technological surprise. Do we want to be a nation that gets technologically surprised by other nations' advances? Uh, remember, I said that uh, Sandia's original historical origin story comes from the Manhattan Project, a spinoff of the Manhattan Project, and the idea of nuclear weapons. And reality is what would have happened had we been technologically surprised by some other country's invention of nuclear weapons, that could have been, had devastating consequences. So in general, this investment in foundational research helps the nation avoid technological surprise, helps us be on the leading edge, so we can be contributing to the advances of mankind instead of surprised by them. I'm just wondering, so then, you know, at these government institutions, um, what does what do like results then look like? Like, how do you convey or like, how do you, um, you know, submit proposals to get like additional funding when it is like when you're, when the, you know, the output is just uh, avoiding technical surprise as you put it? Well, I, I mean, there's, because it's a multi-mission laboratory, there's a myriad of different ways that you can apply for funding within Sandia. I mean, each different funding agency has a little different scope and mission. And so each one of them, I wouldn't say any of them have like just an explicit statement. That's all they want to do is avoid technological surprise. But I think each one of them has a mission that involves innovation. And so innovative discovery and development, uh, you know, basically the essence of R&D is what each one of these funding agencies pays for. And so you have to put it in the context that they care about. Oh, yeah. I, I just love that because... Uh, it's, it's gets murky about what, like exactly like for a company, it's very easy to see. I, they made this amount of money. So the stock price went up this much, but for some of these more fundamental things, the fact that we now know that this nanocrystalline material deforms like this, I feel is so hard to quantify the value. And oh. so uh, well, I think it's just amazing. Yeah. I mean, people do though. I mean, in, in application spaces, they talk about billions of dollars saved in terms of, um, particular applications. So, I mean, those are the real world rubber meets the road outcomes of investment. I, I think contextually about uh, other advances in material science, like um, solid state lighting, what we call LEDs, right? LEDs are everywhere. They're saving billions of dollars a year in energy costs. I don't know the exact numbers, but it's profound how much material science is saving in terms of our energy costs. Uh, the advances in photovoltaics, uh, you know, and the proliferation of energy is available from there. Uh, you know, these all stem from decades upon decades of fund foundational research that led to those innovations and the commercialization of it. Well, great. Well, then let's change gears a little bit. Another foundational research that is hopefully what we were seeing like photovoltaics 20 years ago is the impact of machine learning uh, and the impact on material science and engineering. Could you explain how Sandia is using this fundamental knowledge to build upon what we already know and to apply it to these applications? Yeah, so there's a lot going on everywhere. And of course at Sandia in the domain of machine learning and the intersection between machine learning and material science. M machine learning is kind of a loaded term. There's a lot to machine learning, and I don't want to, you know, take us hours upon hours to unravel all of what that really means. In a simple sense, though, and perhaps overly simplistically, I think of this as new ways to slice through complex data, new analysis methods that go beyond the Excel spreadsheets or the ordinary statistical analysis methods that we used before, and find hidden meaning in data that we would have otherwise missed. And so uh, a lot of the use of material science centers around the discovery of new materials. So uh, you use machine learning as an exploration tool to find new alloys or new um, compositions that might be particularly useful. I'm, I'm leading another project at Sandia that takes a little bit different look at that. Instead of necessarily discovering a new alloy, we're looking at discovering new process conditions. So processing the materials and really the composition and the process go hand in hand, as we know, to form things like the microstructure. And so optimizing the process is a, is a slightly different take. And we're not the only ones in this domain, but 
we're looking at complex processes like electroplating I mentioned previously, uh, or physical vapor deposition, what we call magnetron sputtering, or laser powder bed fusion, the way that we additively manufacture metals. Each one of these are complex deposition processes. They involve a lot of different physical phenomena happening simultaneously, often at very dynamic timescales. And the process engineers have somewhat limited knobs, often many knobs, but they're, they're not direct control over the process. So this relationship between the knobs that you have to control the process, the dynamic physical processes that are actually occurring, and ultimately the optimal material structure to achieve the properties that you want. It's a very complex transfer function where machine learning can help us manage that complexity. So we've learned in previous episodes that those MSCs who have that background or that knowledge of machine learning um, can become like valuable assets to really any company in the material space or, or any field. So what advice would you give to material science and engineering students now to really develop into that, that level of asset that is sought after in any company? If they're a student, I encourage them to find a class on this. If it's not in their curriculum, they could take uh, certificate type courses. Uh, there's various ways to get into it. And sort of, uh, you know, like there's probably no wrong answer or there's, there's a lot of right answers, let me say it that way. Uh, so, you know, if they don't have an application, if they don't, for example, have an internship that's already giving them a pathway to explore this domain, I encourage them to learn about this domain, learn what, you know, take statistics, statistics courses is a great start and then build on those statistics courses through machine learning courses. I think my perspective is the material scientists 10 years from now, the students that we hire 10 years from now will all come with experience. They'll have, they'll come with coursework in this domain and they'll be familiar with these tools from the get-go, just like the material scientists of today are familiar with Excel and many of them with MATLAB, for example. Uh, I think these more advanced analytics will become commonplace over the next decade. Yeah, my so I did an internship in data science, which is a real, completely new thing for me that had some machine learning. And I think the biggest thing for me, the biggest help that I was able to convey to these other people who didn't know material science is that a lot of the fundamental ideas are all statistics and all uh, like some machine learning. Like, uh, the Arrhenius equation is just the probability of something overcoming an energy barrier. And so when you put it like that, you actually do have a lot of experience with statistics. It's just very applied, but it's no different than another type of problem that are now just numbers or customers or anything else. And so I think that uh, what looked to be a Herculean effort to overcome this barrier of like, I don't have any coursework, how do I get in? Breaking it down to the fundamentals really helped me out uh, in that process. But yes, I agree completely is that um, just knowing the tools, maybe if I'm not the best machine learning expert, just knowing what there is uh, has helped me out in the past with data collection. Like now I think about what data is helpful. And so going back to your original question of the process levers, um, I think that a lot of times there's an art form of DOEs and guesses. And so do you think there's any like time scale of like an increase in productivity that you project in the next 10 years from this ML uh, that could help us? Absolutely. I mean, uh, when you call, commented on design of experiments, I think that's exactly one great area where uh, you can use, for example, the domain of Bayesian methods. Bayesian methods will take a set of data in, incoming, we call that the posterior data. And from that data, we inform our guess for the, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm gonna say this wrong. So anyway, the data from the past will infer information about the data from the future. And so um, that continuous updating of our models from the new data that has come in is a new way, it's a new tool in our toolbox, it's really emerging over uh, decades of evolution in statistics. But the idea that each with each new process, as we're manufacturing a product, for example, each new batch might guide a slightly different set of process conditions or optimize the process conditions on the fly uh, as we use these new methods. I want to tie that back to material science, maybe more directly. So we've learned like 
the importance of structure, property, and processing, like that, those relationships, right? Like the tetrahedron, the MSE tetrahedron. Um, but in reality, it's not nearly as simple as, you know, these one-to-one -one relationships, right? There's just so many dimensionalities to it. And so I was just wondering, can you kind of give your input on how to interpret and understand these fundamental concepts and maybe how like machine learning might, might assist in uh, really getting that understanding of those relationships? Right. When I, when I learned about material science, uh, it, I, I hate to date myself, but it was in the 1990s. And there was a book that was uh, released called The uh, Material Science and Engineering for the 1990s. And I remember one of the fundamental focus points of that book was process structure property relationships. It was a relatively new concept back then. And uh, it is a really powerful concept. It's a construct in our mind that we have to understand how the process affects the structure and then ultimately how the structure affects the properties. And that helps us rationalize and make sense of these relationships. But as you say, the dimensionality is where we've been a little dishonest about this. Because when you talk about the process, that's just one word, right? <laughs> no, actually the process, you know, some of these processes I speak of, when we really break down the process like electroplating, there are hundreds of parameters that we can control in that process. So there are hundreds of, hundreds of potential knobs. And again, we can make a list of 100 structure parameters. So now we have 100 process knobs mapping onto potentially 100 structure parameters that also map onto 100 or more interesting properties to us. We often don't care about just one property. We care about several. So that it turns out process structure property, the dimensionality there is enormous, which is what has kept us all employed for so many decades afterwards. And we're going to continue to use that paradigm. But now to me, the challenge is how do we accelerate that search? So how do we accelerate the search? <laughs> I think machine learning will help us manage mm -hmm. high dimensional correlations that we can't manage through other statistical methods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think my favorite example is that like with a basic DOE with like three levers, you can easily get up to like thousands of experiments you would need to do. And so I think right now, uh, I'm currently in classic for design of experiments. And so right now it's just making educated guesses. And I think that ML is just gonna help us be more educated in those guesses. Um, I guess other than the processes, uh, do you see ML having any other great effect in the material science space um, that could profoundly affect how you do material science? Well, I, you know, I think, first of all, let me just make a bit of a disclaimer here. Machine learning and artificial intelligence is not a panacea either. It doesn't, it's just not magic. It doesn't just solve all of our problems, but there is a new slice of utility there that we haven't had before. I view this as a partner with expert knowledge. So it's another way for experts to have a, 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 an analytic slice through the information that they have. But uh, areas where it might impact material science, um, you know, I think you already talked about design of experiments. I'm really interested in the idea of autonomous laboratories. Uh, right now, uh, one word that I've been using a lot this year is artisan research. I heard one speaker recently say that the labs of today don't look terribly different from the labs of Mary Curie. You know, there are benches at waist height that are about uh, arm's length and depth, and they're, they're designed around the ergonomics of a human. And that leads to an artisan practice of us getting in with our hands and holding a beaker and pouring one, you know, we've all been there, the, we've seen the labs, we've seen the heat treat ovens. Now, if you go to industry or manufacturing, that analogy breaks down. Things in manufacturing no longer necessarily look like that. How do we transform the laboratory to be more autonomous, to be more automatic to be less dependent on uh, uh, you know a scientist wearing their lab coat and knowing that if I pour this beaker into that it will you know that's what I want to try because humans are slow we make mistakes and some of these things are also dangerous uh, so this all you know there's a lot of benefits for uh, lab autonomy that could also potentially extend to the analysis too like I'm imagining like uh, scanning electron microscopy or like optical microscopy. And, um, you know, right now it's just, it's pattern thinking almost, but, you know, very advanced and maybe we can incorporate ML into the analysis as well. That's what I was doing yesterday. We were loading 
hundreds of samples into an SEM and the SEM was automatically uh, moving from sample to sample and imaging each sample so we could collect thousands of data sets autonomously. That's the type of stuff that I think will be the future for material scientists. Before we load one sample in the SEM, we wait for the vacuum to pump down, drink our coffee, and then we look at that image and we make our own qualitative interpretation of that subjective image, and, and then we write our paper. That's not the material science of the future. I think the material science of the future are thousands of those images being analyzed through these uh, filtering algorithms that allow us to discover the latent features that are controlling behavior. So yeah, now that we're talking about the future, as material scientists and engineers, we have lots of choices in the direction we want to take our careers. So for our younger listeners who are in high school or in college, um, why should our listeners work for a national lab like you do, and maybe specifically why Sandia? Well, I mean, first of all, the U.S., it's, you know, one of its crown jewels in science and engineering is its national lab system. Uh, we have a number of great national labs that are funded largely by government funding. Um, and this allows our, our government to be, or our, our country to be innovators. Uh, we, our economy is a direct result of the innovations uh, that our country makes. And those innovations, a lot of them stem out of our national lab system. So, you know, I think that's a, a, a simple reason why to be part of a national lab. Now, um, I think, again, you know, you'd look at the mission statement of different laboratories. And as I mentioned, you know, I, I think of Sandia as like a global peace enabler. And so that's why I like in particular Sandia's mission. Uh, but I also like Sandia from the perspective of the diversity of research that goes on here. As I've already described, we have everything from basic science all the way up to applied engineering. And that, to me, that whole spectrum approach to technology is you know rare. We've already discussed that industry struggles sometimes with that. And, uh, and even somewhat rare in the national lab system. We tend to have national labs that specialize in basic energy science, basic science, and others perhaps that are a little more applied. Sandia certainly is viewed as a bit more applied, and I, I sit in the area of Sandia that it crosses the spectrum, but uh, you know that's why what attracts me to the national labs and Sandia. Yeah, I will say that you know Sandia is known specifically for being a really engineering-oriented lab, and so I think we tend to attract more of the engineer types, uh, but still there's plenty of room for people like me who want to do both. And how many material scientists and engineers uh, currently work at Sandia? Oh, gosh, hundreds, hundreds, maybe, wow. I don't know, four or 500. And, and some of the directly inside the material science, we have this organization called Materials, Chemistry and Physics. Um, some of them reside right inside this organization. and Others are sort of distributed through application groups or other groups within Sandia. So I can't give you an exact number, but certainly hundreds. Where, you know, one way I think of this is a uh, academic department. So at a university, the materials department may have 10 or 20 materials professors. Well, we're 10 times, at least 10 times the size of that. We, we have hundreds of PhD material scientists here. So it's like showing up every day to 10 academic departments that are all geographically co-located. And the, the density of knowledge here is just amazing. So then would you say that in order to kind of get a job at Sandia with a materials background, it would be imperative to um, have your PhD or are there um, people with a bachelor's or master's that also uh, get involved at Sandia? You know, when I hired on, I think it was almost entirely PhDs, but increasingly there's been more of a diversity of different levels being hired into Sandia and probably other national labs too, because of our engineering uh, applications. We, we also hire a lot of master's level uh, engineers. And at the bachelor's levels, we've been hiring more and more as well, especially when it comes to more of the hands-on research, like inside the lab, uh, where it may not necessarily require a PhD to be a significant contributor. And so, uh, yeah, we're we hire at every level, even associate's degrees. So yeah, to wrap it up, we've talked a lot today about the research going on at Sandia and what it's like to work there. Uh, if our listeners do want to try to get employed and go for one of those jobs, uh, how would you recommend them finding a job? And then do you have any tips on how to stick out from the rest of the crowd? Well, before I forget it, the webpage is careers.sandia.gov. 
that will let you search and you can search on keywords there from there, or you can just peruse the list. Um, you know, I think that's still the foot in the door and we have a pretty uh, straightforward process to vet your resume against other resumes to decide if you're worth interviewing. You know, our goal is to find the best candidates for the job. And uh, we hope that you're among the best and can come in here and we can find you through the resume system. I mean, we sift through all those resumes and look for the best candidates and we, we want to find you. Uh, you know, so that, that process does work and it works frequently. Uh, in addition to that ordinary process, of course, the ways that you can network with, with uh, people at any company through LinkedIn or through meeting them at conferences or uh, the various other pathways to grow your network. Of course, if you have those network connections, they may also have particular insight into a job opening. But, you know, I, I think those don't necessarily, it's, you know, those can help a little bit, but the ordinary path through the website is not a dead end. Some people, I think, get the false impression because, you know, nine out of 10 times you may not hear a response, but that's just because you actually probably weren't the fit they were looking for. And so uh, you may not know that by their one page job description. So just try it out and see. The one thing I, I will say about uh, networking is that you kind of learn how to craft your resume and, and adjust it to maybe uh, fit the values and the mission of Sandia and maybe um, particular roles and just learning about the roles that are available. So that's um, I know Sandia attends like the Georgia Tech career fair and, and they have info sessions. So that's the one thing I would add to, to your point, Brad, that attending those, you can really learn about the roles available and then really craft a resume and refine it from there. Absolutely. Sandy is very conscious about partnering with universities, not only through career fairs, but also through funding university research. We have specific academic partners like Georgia Tech, where we have a really deep and uh, intimate uh, connection, but we're generally interested in making sure that we're fostering the development of the next generation of our employees and that, that those employees, those future employees, those students know about us and, and know to submit their resume because we want to, uh, we're matchmakers. We want to make this perfect match where somebody with just the right background gets put into a position where they're going to succeed. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Brad, for joining us today. This was awesome. I, I really learned a lot. Um, and we're, we're very excited for uh, this episode to be released to our audience. Thank you both. I appreciate the discussion. It was fun. As a materials engineer, we can make an impact in nearly every single industry. But with that versatility comes a lot of different options to choose from. So if you have no idea which industry or position is right for you, believe me, you're not alone. I've been there, done that. But just for a moment, imagine narrowing down your ideal role in company by the end of this week. Imagine being able to secure your dream job offer without having to apply to hundreds of job openings. Our online course, MSE Academy, includes video testimonials, resumes, interview prep, and mentorship from materials engineers who have been in your shoes. We also connect our members with companies and industry professionals in our expansive network to help accelerate your job search as much as possible. To learn more and get started, simply click the link in the description below. And if you enroll within the next 24 hours, we'll add three bonus career development resources. I hope to see you there.